with a few seconds, about six seconds or so, and then we'll be ready to start. Welcome back to another episode of the Quaker Keeps podcast. I'm Cameron Hay at Cameron underscore Hay on Twitter. Of course, I have Drew Williams with me at Dope is Drew on Twitter. And for the last episode of season one, we are joined by a very special guest hailing from Toronto, Canada. You, you've heard his music. You definitely heard anything he's produced for the last probably seven years on the radio in some way, shape, or form. We are joined by Grammy Award winning producer, 1985. How are you doing? What's up? I appreciate that uh, introduction there. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm just chilling in Toronto. Been How is it? More than the last few years, that's for sure. <laughs> the pandemic's kept you pretty still, huh? Yeah, this is the least traveling I've done since probably like 2011. Wow. Yeah. Has it affected your process at all in you when it comes to making music or are you been still getting busy? Not so much because I don't really leave I don't really leave my house or like my production space anyways. I'm kind of just like locked in all the time anyways. I think it's changed like how interactive I am with like the artists and writers. I haven't been in many sessions with other people, but other than that, I'm kind of just locked in. Cool, cool, cool. So, like I said, you helped shape the sound of R&B and hip hop for almost the better part of a decade. But for people who don't know much about like your upbringing or anything like that, how did you get into making music? Like, what was your introduction into music? Um, I guess you could say my introduction was I randomly I randomly was at my uncle's house going through a bunch of CDs he had and I played this Jimi Hendrix CD and I was like, yo, I think this is what I want to do. I want to be Jimi Hendrix. Don't ask right. me why. Like, that was just what I thought was like my path to like whatever, anything music based. So then I, I literally just went out and got a guitar. I started delivering papers, saved up money, bought a guitar, maybe like three, four months later, and I, I actually just started teaching myself how to play Jimi Hendrix songs. Wow. So just by ear, pretty much. You learned how to... By ear. All, <laughs> all just like playing it, stopping it, pulling it back, figuring out what that little 15 second part was, doing that again until I, I figured out how to play a bunch of those songs. And so guitar, that was the first instrument you learned how to play, or did you know anything before that? It's crazy because my parents tried to put me in piano lessons when I was younger and I hated it. Like I, <laughs> I really just did not like it. And um, I think now I sort of wish I did stick with the piano lessons even more because obviously if you can play piano, I, I think everything else comes that much easier to you. But for whatever reason, guitar just stuck with me more. And then like a, a few of the things that I learned earlier with, with piano kind of come back more now Okay. But at the time, it was just guitar. That's all I wanted to do. And then from guitar, how do you go from playing guitar, learning how to play guitar, into full-on production, producing music? Like, how did you slowly transition over time into that realm? Um, when I was, I would say, like, 13, maybe, a few of my friends, we made a band. And I kind of had the crazy idea that I was going to like make all the songs for everybody. <laughs> so I learned how to produce without knowing I was producing. So I would write all the parts. So I'd do like the guitar part, the bass part, the drum part, and then I would write all the words too. Okay. So because of that, I sort of fell into being a producer at like 13 because that's what a producer does. You just like yeah. putting together the song. I had no clue that's what I was doing. I was just like, yeah, well, somebody's going to make a song, so I guess I'll do it, and I'll, I'll have my friends play the song with me, and we'll see how that goes. And it was kind of short-lived. It didn't really go anywhere, but that was my first jump into actually putting songs together. And then when I was a bit older, I really wanted to be a DJ. I still don't want to be a DJ. Um, 
I, I DJ now, but I think part of me still thinks DJing is more fun than producing. <laughs> you know, DJing seems like the fun aspect of what producers do. You know, they're the ones who really get to talk to the crowd and see how an audience responds to music. Even though that's what we do as producers, I feel like there's a much bigger disconnect from the world of a producer to seeing how people respond to it. Because most of the time, people don't even know you produce the song. That's that's true. Right. That yeah. is true. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I sort of fell into producing through wanting to DJ. This girl that I was dating in high school, her older brother was a DJ, and I wanted him to teach me how to DJ. And I didn't know he produced, because I didn't even know what production was. I Like, I had no clue what went into that i was just i just knew that there was like timberland kanye pharrell i knew uh, i knew of them i had no clue what they did so um one day i was kind of just like you know what let me just ask him to dj you know let me just ask him like maybe i can use his turntables or something like anything and he was like yeah i heard you play guitar and i was like yeah he's like can you play guitar for me on this song and i was like uh sure yeah I, I guess he's all right cool i just need you to just like record a loop for me and i did that and he's like do you do like bass or anything too and i was like i can he's like all right sure can you like put a bass down to that guitar you just recorded i was like all right man sure whatever you know he's like what about drums like you play drums <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I do play drums he's like all right cool well i got this drum machine just do what you would do on drums on the machine i was like uh okay <laughs> you know like all right whatever i did that and he's like there you just produced a song and i was like what he's like you just produced your first record i was like uh, what does that mean like he's like <laughs> you're a producer uh, and literally it happened in like 15 minutes so I, I literally had no plan of being a producer or ever wanting to be a producer. I knew I loved producers. I didn't know what they did. So yes. until that actual day of him just being like, here, do this, do this, do this, there, you're a producer now. I never planned to be a producer. Still to this day, <laughs> I'll <laughs> tell everybody I just want to be a DJ. And, okay, you, so your first beat you made was from scratch, no no sampling or anything. You you made every beat on it for the first one. Completely from scratch. I had no clue what I was doing. He just got me to record a few loops and then said, There, you're done. I was like, Okay, but done what? Like what <laughs> and when he played it back and he's like, it sounds all right to me. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know that they were all gonna be together <laughs> you know like, right. right and just went from there did the song come out good or for the first time what would you give yourself like for the first time you actually made a song now i would give myself like a one <laughs> a 1. 1.5 <laughs> wait in that moment when you said you made your first beat and you pretty much learned that moment, that's what you did is that when you really knew like this is something that you want you could pursue and make a living out of or was it later on down the line after that first song you made? honestly i don't think i knew i could make a living out of producing until maybe like 2015. wow that's after i already had stuff out on the radio and I was actually seeing like a regular income from it. Cause this is the thing that people don't realize when you're, well, for one, when you're broke, it's, it feels like forever, like the stage from being broke to being like a sustainable producer. And two, you don't get paid right away from the song. So you can have the biggest song on the radio. You still have to wait anywhere from eight months to a year and a half to really start seeing like, substantial royalty checks from that yeah right. well, you can imagine if you're broke and a lot of times as producers you're like broke broke because any money you get you end up putting back into being a producer you end up buying your laptop and buying plugins and buying equipment and then paying for studio time so you didn't really have that much money to begin with and whatever you do have goes right back into producing so i had a few decent records but i i wouldn't say i 
and felt like financially comfortable, you know, and you still have family and friends kind of looking at you like, yo, your record's everywhere. Why like, why you still look broke? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> what's going on over there? Like I just heard your song on the radio a, a few minutes ago. Doesn't that mean that money's coming through? And it's like, no, not cool. You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't equate to that type of path from what the listener hears to what the producer or even the artist or the writer are are you know compensating from those records. Yeah. So for me, 2015 is around the time where I now had a couple records that had done some some decent numbers and I wasn't necessarily waiting for the next record to hit. Yeah. Because they're so broke when those first few records do hit that a record might hit, but you've already been like owing people waiting for it to hit. So by the time the money comes in, you owe this person, you owe that person, you got a car payment, you got insurance, you got all these things. Real life is trying to come in. Yeah. yeah, because it might be 10 months after the song came out, but you still had to figure out how to make it work during all that time when you weren't really generating money. So it took a few like big songs for me to really think like, okay, I, I think I'm okay. Like I might not need another job. <laughs> all right. All right. So 2015, of course, you say 2015, like that, that's probably it, it, like how long bling is probably around the time where you really like blew up, like you really felt comfortable at that point. Like when you had that doing numbers after you already did hold on going home. You did too much on nothing with the fans. Of course, other records as well. But so you say 2015, is that the record that did it for you? Yeah, I think it was a combination. Hotline Bling was out. Truffle Butter was out. Zero to 100 was out. Hold On, We're Going Home had already been kind of like bubbling for now a little bit over a year. Yeah. So I think it was like the combination of all of those things at one time where I finally felt like, you know what? I'm, I'm a producer now. Like I, I do this for a living. Like this is no longer me saying one day I'll make it. It's a bit of a hobby. I'm just seeing how things are going. That was, the, I think that was the first year of me really being comfortable in like owning the occupation of producer. All right. Wow. It's funny you mentioned Hotline Bling. Sam and I were talking about it earlier. When Hotline Bling dropped, you know, it dropped with Charged Up and Right Hand. And then right after that, back to back came out and it kind of felt like it kind of got buried in the, the shuffle of everything happening. But then it eventually became one of Drake's bigger records. Did you guys think that it would have that type of impact coming in? And did you expect for it to bubble that quickly? We thought it would. It was a really interesting time in Drake's career because that's when all the meat stuff had just hit. Everybody was expecting him to give some sort of answer. OVO Fest was maybe like a week or two after. Yeah. Like there were so many other variables that I think Drake played it so well in not, I guess like not focusing on the obvious radio song. You know, as much as he is a pop star in that moment, he still needed to respond to, you know, the other side of Drake, which is the rapper who is, you know, like responsible to like respond in a moment where you have a back and forth with another, you know, another like equal voice. You yeah. know, because Meek's voice at the time was huge. And right. I think he did play it so well in in not allowing that moment to become like, yo, I'm gonna do what the radio wants me to do. I have to do what is like most organic for Drake. And that's why I think everybody at the time was just kind of like, okay with knowing that this might be the big song, but we're not pushing it as the big song because the other, the other song or songs need to live for this to play out properly for Drake. And it, and it did. Yeah, it ended up working perfectly. Like that song, like Drew just said, it caught fire. It feels like, months after it, it released and it became this huge record. How did definitely. you and, oh, go ahead, go ahead, finish. No, I was gonna say definitely. Yeah, like, so how did you and Drake, the OVO connection even come about? How did, 
how did you link up with him and that whole collective? Um, I don't know if there's any one specific moment. We definitely connected long before our music careers took off. Um, I I knew him just like personally through a friend of mine who was on Degrassi with him. Okay. So I just knew him as uh, Aubrey. It wasn't even, you know, Drake the rapper. And then right around the time he he was really starting to make noise outside of Toronto, we we got reconnected through, I would say, 40 in future. So Drake's manager and DJ is Future the Prince. I'm close friends with him. And then I also have a great relationship with 40, who's basically like his main producer. And I've sort of just like always been around those guys. So even when Drake was making his moves into, you know, the, I guess the American market, I was always fully knowing of what was happening, but I never really, I think I just thought like, I guess if it's meant to be, it'll be like, I never really pushed beats to him or it was never really about that. It's just like, yo, I know these guys and I love what they're doing because nobody's really done that from Toronto before. And things very organically fell into place. Yeah, definitely. And like, it's just crazy. Like you, like you said, you never forced it on, like forced your music towards or anything like that. And it just organically happens that you end up producing some of these huge records. But you've also produced like B sides or album cuts for him as well that people love. Like, do you get the same type of enjoyment when you produce these huge big records as you do with B sides, or do you like doing either one a little bit more? Do you get more gratification when like fans latch on to a record that wasn't supposed to be a hit and it ends up becoming like a fan favorite? It's a really good question. I think I think they hit in different ways. So when like especially when we're on tour and we're in other countries and other cities, and you see 15 to 20,000 people screaming this record that you made, there's always something special about that. Nothing can replace that. But then you also have those moments where somebody's like, yo, this is my favorite song ever. It helped me through this crazy time. And they're like, yo, I didn't know you produced too much. <laughs> you know? And it's like, that, that in itself is something too, because those are the songs like everybody has a certain moment with like a hotline bling or hold on we're going home but it's the other songs where other people feel like this is my personal song like this is my like there's certain songs on albums you almost wish they don't get released or don't become singles so you don't want them to be the big moment you want that to be like your own personal connection with the artist yeah i, have, I do have a couple of those with drake too and i think it's equal but very different it's like a very different um satisfaction that you get just from seeing like how it touches people and also like my personality i i don't even necessarily like screaming out like yo i'm the guy that made this record or friends kind of do that more than i would ever do that for myself like going to the club with certain people is the worst because as soon as the song comes on they're telling everybody you know he made this <laughs> i'm like ah man just, you know, like, let people enjoy it but that's that also is a cool thing to see like yo i can make a club of two thousand people move yeah you know that's not easy so i think it's just like two different sides of the same feeling well i have to tell you what, what was that the summer work one dance that summer 2016 that rotation of work one dance control i know you didn't do controller and work but that three man weave that those tracks <laughs> you're on the club, your dance with a girl for three songs straight off of them two, them three. Yeah. That's 316 summer. And for free as well. Oh, yeah, for free. Yeah, for like, free. nah, Drake. Honestly, there's, there's, there's never another, like, it's hard to say because we're in the moment, but there's never going to be another artist like that. You know, to have the ability to like to fully be in the moment and ahead of the moment. You know, we've seen so many people go and do like these island inspired records since then, 
but for him to be the guy that really like owned that, but so authentic to him. I think a lot of people thought he was just like riding a wave, but if you're from Toronto, that is our wave, you know? That that's like as authentically Drake as you can get and for him to be able to like see the timing of when these things would work and to hit it on the like to hit the nail on the head so many different times in his career you just got to you know like give it up to him for that yeah and then like you like you said the, with the like island records you did of course one dance but then you've also done Mediba rhythm and get it together on more life did you you just get that inspiration from being around Toronto or is that type of music that was played during your upbringing? Like, how do you come about making those specific type of records that don't sound like a hotline bling or a too much or a hold on, we're going home? Like, Yeah, I would say some of it's Toronto. Some of it is, you know, I am half Jamaican. So these are things you are just hearing at like family gatherings or whatever. And then I think I think some of it just comes from being a like such a big fan of music. The funny thing is, growing up, my parents basically only really played gospel music. <laughs> you know, so like even when I started playing guitar, they're like, "Oh, you're playing the devil's music." I'm like, ah, it's not <laughs> you know, like, like that's it's so weird that I'm now the guy that's making all of music that when I was growing up, they probably wouldn't have wanted me to listen to. And that also might be like half the reason why I did gravitate towards the music so much when I was younger, because it was like this taboo thing, like, oh, don't listen to that. You should be listening to things that are praising God. And I was like, mm, I don't know if that's my thing. Like, that's cool for you guys. <laughs> but I sort of had to find my own way in music. And because of that, I probably dove way deeper into music than even like a lot of the like the people I grew up with just because of not necessarily having like immediate access to these things. Like a lot of other people, their parents were probably listening to who knows the Brandy album or the J album or whatever those things. I had to to things on the low, you know, like <laughs> I'll never forget. I had a babysitter one time. She brought the Biggie Life or Death album. <laughs> And I, I literally was like, "Yo, every time you come, can you just like slide me that album?" And one day my mom was like, "Yo, what are you doing? Like, you know, you're not supposed to listen to this." I was like, "Ah, please." She's like, "Nope." You know, so those things stuck out to me. So whenever I did get a chance to hear the music, I was always trying to figure out like, how can I get more? You know, yeah. that was like prohibition to me. I need more. Life after death is a crazy album, though. Like, it really is. It's a, it's a crazy <laughs> album. So, like, of course, talking about Toronto and everything, and you, of course, having a connection with, with like you say, a future Drake Forty, and of course, with OVO, other producers like Boy Wonder, and then work that Majid Jordan does and everything. Like, do those guys inspire you to keep like making newer records? Do you guys like? Like, is it an iron sharpens iron type of situation? Do you ever pull any inspiration from those guys? And likewise, they're pulling inspiration from you? Honestly, um, I tell people all the time, like, my, my biggest inspiration are my friends. And I think, I think the interesting thing about my career is I sort of, I sort of found my way a lot later than those guys. But yeah. those guys were already some of the biggest producers in the world. So when your friends are 40, T minus, Boy Wanda, and guys like that, and they are literally the biggest producers in the world, you have no choice but to say, all right, let me step my game up because if they can do it, and I've known these guys for years and years and years, like T minus and some of these guys I've known since we were literally kids, you know? So to see that, and I remember working at H&M and T minus is coming in and talking to me about music, you know? So for us to have gone from those stages in our life to now they were huge. A lot of it for me was just like, okay, maybe I'm on the right path. I'm not sure, but all I do know is everybody around me has stepped their game up. So I have no excuse now, you know, all these guys that I've known forever, 
they're all doing what I think I should be doing. So I got to do it at least on their level because there's no excuse now. Before our excuse, a lot of times was it's hard being from Toronto. You know, nobody ever really makes it from Toronto. Producers don't and artists might. But then when those guys did it, it's like, okay, cool. There's no more excuses. That's crazy. Right. And then, like, of course, we've, we've, spoke, we've spoken about Drake as well, but you're most notably known for your work with Division as one half of the group. How did that group come about being formed with you and Daniel? Like, was that something you always wanted to do, was make an R&B group, like, as you progressed as a producer, or did this just kind of just stumble into this? Bit of both. Um, I would probably say, and it's crazy for me to say this, I've always liked rap more than R&B, even though I'm sort of known as like the smooth producer that is like <laughs> giving all these artists like their R&B sound. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have ever said that R&B is the, the direction I wanted to go. And that's probably part of the reason why Daniel and I got along so well. When I met him, he was rapping. Wow. Both of us pretty much wanted to do like the rap side of things, you know, like I wanted to be Kanye or Timberland and he probably wanted to be like Jay-Z or something. I don't think <laughs> we saw ourselves as like this amazing R&B duo. Um, I think the trust we have for each other is what allowed us to kind of steer each other in the direction we did go instead of trying to be you know a rap group or whatever that might have been um and it's funny because still to this day i'm a little bit surprised i'm in an r&b group you know, <laughs> i'm a little bit like shocked like yo that's that's the direction you went wow you know like this it's working for you i probably you know, younger me probably would have thought if you're going to do something, it would be along the lines of like, you know, whatever Kanye was to Jay-Z or Just Blaze to Jay, you know, like those were my influences when I wanted to produce. And that's also probably why I sample so much. Yeah, you know? definitely. Well, for me, I'm a huge fan of like 90s and, you know, early 2000s R&B. So that traditional R&B sound that you guys do, I really appreciate that we can still get that from you guys because Cam and I talk about it a lot. We feel like in R&B, the lines kind of become blurred a lot between hip hop and rap. So you kind of get a hybrid thing. And Cam and I were talking earlier about something like 2 beat, for example, where it's traditional R&B in a sense, like it's like a, you know, a ballad almost, yeah. like, but it's very trap, trap heavy drums on it where you're getting like a modern take on it. Was that really a thought of yours of, you know, having, having like a modern take on R&B when you guys came together to make the division? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was conscious. I think we've always made a point to like, especially you mentioned the drums to make the drums knock more than most R&B did. I, th I think it's changing now, but I think even when we started, we wanted to do the things we loved in hip hop. You know, we wanted to make sure the bass was heavier and make sure that the drums knocked more and make sure that the same people who were enjoying the rap songs we loved would have you know, at least some sort of reaction to maybe these R&B songs in a way that they wouldn't have really thought they would, you know? And I think that's something that we've always, I guess, tried to walk, walk the line and, and blur those two worlds and see like how far we can go, like how much can we get away with before people are like, ah, you're not really, you know, traditional R&B anymore, or maybe you're a little bit too modern. So almost any, division song you listen to it's like there's always this blending happening and uh at the same time i think sometimes we are a little bit like nervous like is this going to connect with people in the way that it does for us because there isn't necessarily a guideline for it 
But it's funny because the other day we were having a conversation and I was sort of like, yo, like I love the space R&B is in now, but it also feels like men don't really make songs for women anymore. I say this all the time. (laughs) Yeah, well, they're sort of making songs for men, which is cool and there's a space for that. But I think the reason we loved R&B from before was like, that was like how guys communicated with women. Like, you just do an R&B song. Like, you, you pick the song, whether it's a woman or a man, and that's like, that's saying the things that you didn't necessarily know how to say or didn't want to say. It's like, a song for it. Like, let me go, let me go find the song that expresses this thing because that's gonna express it better than me. Now, I don't know. It's like men are in this weird place of not necessarily wanting to be as vulnerable in R and B. And the strange thing is, it sounds sort of like the rappers are getting more vulnerable than the singers are. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I feel like OVO, you guys really waved that flag heavy. I, Cam and I talk about PND, Drake, you guys, Roy. Your music will be perfect for just chilling, you know, chilling out with a girl, just hanging out with her, or you want a woman back. And you 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 <laughs> you provide music for that pocket, you know, riding home with another, you know, homie girl, you know, doing all that. Yeah. Yeah, I think the amazing thing with everybody on on the team is everybody's very comfortable in their space and understand the importance of like creating a mood you know creating the the setting you know and i'm i'm not saying that there should be any one specific mood but it's just like when you are in a mood or whatever that is if that mood is turning up or that mood is turning down with your girl I, I think OVO has been pretty amazing at like always being that space for you. You know, you can always go to whatever OVO album it is and like make sure you're you're good. That's a right. fact. And so you said it was 2015 where you knew you could really start making money and be successful as a producer. With Division, I remember the first song I heard from you guys on OVO Sound Radio and it was The Line. I think that was the first song that I heard from you guys. When did you know when that division itself, outside of your own production as a group, could really become what it has become now? Did you ever think when you guys first started making music together that it would become this like Im- important R and B act of this generation, or did it take a while for you to actually see the people catch on to it and for you to actually believe, all right, we have something special here? The funny thing about that is. I would say that, and Daniel would always kind of be like, I don't know, man, like, <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna be what you're saying it is. Like, I, I feel like you're kind of just like hyping it up a little bit, we'll see. And I was like, no, 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 like this is, I think we might change the direction of R&B right now. He's like, ah, those are like, those are big words. Like, I get what you're saying, but to put that on us, mm, it's just, Let's not get ahead of ourselves. And I, I think that was always my thing with the vision that because I was coming from having these like big pop moments and big successful moments not in the RB space, something about it made me look at the RB space differently than I think if I had just been trying to do r&b only because i had seen it's almost like seeing things on the other side of the fence yeah looking looking back towards r&b i was like oh r&b is ready to do some stuff it hasn't done like i can see where things are going to go to and where they're going to open up to and i can see how different sounds are going to influence it and i can see and even if you just kind of like follow my career and some of my bigger moments I'm always mixing things that shouldn't necessarily have worked, you know, whether it's like sampling a random UK house song or taking Afrobeat before this side of the world has really like understood what it's gonna be. 
And because I've always been okay with just doing what shouldn't necessarily work and it working, I think that's why I was like, yo, I know, like, I know how it's going to go. You know, I, I feel like I can see a little bit into the future and people are going to accept this more than it might have seemed like they would. And I think, you know, I definitely got to give a lot of thanks to my team around me because they were very supportive of that. Mm-hmm. When there's times that they, they probably should have been like, yo, 85, you're crazy. You know, like, <laughs> let's, let's slow it down a bit. Let's do something a little bit more traditional. But they they kind of gave me that support needed to do those things. And that's why I was able to even, you know, hit up Oliver and be like, yo, can I do one of the OVO Sound radio shows? I want to introduce this division thing. I'm doing. And the crazy thing is people don't realize, like, we weren't signed to OVO when that happened. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. You know, like, we were just doing our own thing. But based on my relationship with all the guys, I was able to be like, yo, Ollie, like, if you can do me this one favor, you know, let's have another conversation after that. Because I think people are going to, like, react to these records and stuff like that. But we weren't actually signed. We were signed probably like a month before the album came out or something. But everybody always just assumed, you know, especially based on me working so closely with the rest of the team. I think everybody assumed like, oh, you guys planned that really well. I like how you, you know, unveiled Division being (laughs) on on OVO Sound. But it, it wasn't that we unveiled Division and there was no big plan. It literally was... I had released those songs on Rubio Sound Radio. There was a lot of traction, a lot of interest. And then we kind of decided, you know what, let's just stick with the home team and keep doing what's been working. That's incredible. Like, yeah, I remember so that OVO Sound episode is the one where you guys debuted Too Deep in the line, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, those are end up on the debut album September 5th. And that's kind of become like, it feels like a cult classic in a sense. Like the energy around that album, the reception was really high. But like you said, experimenting and taking things a different direction or like kind of pushing the boundaries. I think you guys did that even more with Amuse and Her Feelings, like with this, with your last album. What was the decision or thought process behind not doing any features really for the first two albums and now on this one having as many features and different sounds that you guys did. Did you guys just decide we want to take it to another level on this third album or did it just happen to come apart, come organically like this through relationships that you have built with all of these different artists? It was a bit of both. The first two albums, it wasn't necessarily a con- conscious decision not to have other features, but we were just so locked in a zone that by the time we came up for air, the albums were done. Like I'm saying the first album we didn't have a plan. We just had an album finished, signed to OVO, and a few weeks later put out an album. <laughs> there wasn't like a big rollout or anything. It was just really like, yo, the album's out. And people were like, yo, I love how you guys planned that. It was sort of this hidden thing, and you dropped this gem out of nowhere. That wasn't necessarily planned. That was more just us like going with the flow of things and then actually having that collection of songs and be like, all right, cool, there, the album's done. And then with Morning After, we we had released September 5th, I guess, beginning of 2016, went on tour for that album, came home for like three weeks, went on tour for, for Drake's project, and we went on the Summer 16 tour. And then from there to... I guess almost like a year and a half later, we were just like constantly on the road, somehow made the next album and just dropped it. So there wasn't even a thought of like, who should we get for these songs? We were just like in the middle of the whirlwind. And then finally, when everything stopped, it was more of the fans that were like, you guys dropped two classics, no features. And we were like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess we did. You know, we, that wasn't like, uh, it, it wasn't really a decision going into it. It wasn't until after the fact where people sort of pointed that out. But then on the next album, it also wasn't a decision like, yo, 
you got to put features on everything because you do have a lot of features. You know, I think it was more just like, yo, who sounds, who sounds good coming into this world with us? Oh, you know what? Let's hit up Future. Let's hit up Ty. We've worked with him a bunch before. Um, what's Popcorn saying? You know, let's let's play some records for him. Let's see what he wants to do or which one stands out to him. And I I think us having great relationships worked out amazing for us because we were able to bring all these people into our world in a way that was still very natural for them. You know, like Amusing Her Feelings is definitely one of my favorite albums from this year. Like, definitely. And I, I like the way that you guys brought all of those features in. Like you said, it, it kind of, they fit seamlessly. Like nobody feels out of place. And so it's impressive to see how it all came about and came together. Thank you. And I think there's something about the way our albums resonate with people. Like even how you were saying September 5th is like a cult classic. For whatever reason, it's like our albums hit people harder, like way after the fact. Yes. Because literally as Amusing Her, Her Feelings came out, all of a sudden I started seeing all these people reaching out to me being like, yo, Morning After might be like <laughs> that life changing project. And I'm like, Morning After? Like we're onto the new album, yeah. but I don't know what it is. It's just like, that's how people digest our albums. That's, it's like, that's how people in music in general, I'm, I'm one of those people, I can't speak for Drew, I don't know how he is, but I'm somebody who I'll listen to an album and then I'll come back to it a few months later and I'll pick something new up or it might hit me in a different space. Like I'm in a different space now than I was four or five months ago and it just sounds better to me now for whatever reason because maybe i can relate to the the music a little bit differently so that that might just be the the natural process for the listener just whatever they're going through it's it's going to be really interesting to see how this album connects to people because this is the first album where we definitely wanted to make an album that's um easily playable in regular lifestyle settings because we did know that a lot of people say we only make bedroom music. And there's, nothing, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that because we definitely do <laughs> make bedroom music. But I think this is the first project of like full body of work where we said, let's make stuff that works in all these different spaces. And then ironically, pandemic hits. So we have all these records that actually have way more tempo than normal, but there's yeah. not the spaces to play them in. So I kind of wonder how that translates for people. Like, does that hit the same in your house, but you wish you were in the club? You know, like I've always wondered how how people will remember this album looking back on it, knowing that this is probably one of the only times every record you have to be in your house no matter what. Yeah. All right. Well, I was on the summer 16 tour and I remember that's probably, you know, one of the better tours that I've ever been on to. I mean, I'm not old enough. I didn't get to go see Michael Jackson live, but I mean, <laughs> guys, Drake, Future, Roy was there, I believe. Um, guest every night. Can you talk about what is your favorite story from that tour? And I, I remember that tour being huge. I, I went two nights in, or, in, in Oakland at Oracle. So I know how big it was. Man, that tour was historic. <laughs> um, there were so many guests. It's hard to even narrow it down. I remember one night, Madison Square Garden, Kanye came out, Rihanna came out. I think Dipset came out. <laughs> yeah. Man, there were there were a lot of special guests on that tour. Atlanta was another one. Because Atlanta, Usher came out, Gucci came out, Doug came out. This is cool. That's tough. You I think you almost gotta go by city. You know, certain <laughs> cities like New York was crazy. What other city was crazy? 
you know what I realized on that tour? Because because certain cities don't normally get huge concerts, the cities that turn up are the cities that you would never expect. Like you'll be in Kansas and they are going <laughs> wild. Right? Yeah. Wild, like screaming nonstop, beginning to like beginning of the show right to the end. But yeah, just in general, that whole tour was like you're saying, I, I don't think I've been to any show like it really. I don't know if there's like I can't even think of other sh like concerts or shows I've been to that are even close to that summer sixteen tour. That was that was a moment in time for sure. Dude. Yeah. yeah. And also like, the run that Drake had that summer with the songs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some artists would dream of having one of those he had like six or seven or something at the same time like, yeah. it was, <laughs> it's not even fair and like so like we're talking about this tour and everything like Drew is speaking about how an artist from Canada is basically having this huge tour the, the biggest tour he's ever been to and you guys all being from Canada, like you said, you thought earlier before before you broke through and saw Boy Wanda and Forty and those guys break through, nobody had ever done it this big. And now you guys are a hotbed pretty much for hip hop and R&B. It seems like like it seems like you guys between Drake, Division, P and D, uh, anybody like even Tory Lanez for I mean, when he came out, the weekend exactly like you guys. Are, pulling out stars, it seems like, every year. Like, how does it feel to be from Canada and now see that you actually can produce stars on a, a global level and seeing the impact of the music that you guys make on a worldwide scale? It's definitely still surreal because it's still, it still doesn't feel like we're, I guess, we're in the middle of like if if we're gonna say the states are like the i guess the gauge of what's hot a lot of times in the you know the musical atmosphere it doesn't feel like we're in the middle of that it still feels like we're to the side or we're the little brother or the cousin of that so it still does feel a little bit like is this really happening you know, and I think one of the first times I realized how far we reached was when I was in the UK on Drake's Would You Like a Tour? And that was in the O2 Arena. And I walked into the stands and there was a group of people that had all made t-shirts. They'd all made their own personal t-shirts. And all the area codes on the t-shirts were t-shirts from like my hometown, not their hometown. So there was like 25 people all with these homemade shirts and it said like area codes from Toronto. And That's I was crazy. like, this is crazy. Cause this, like, it probably means nothing to them and it still means everything to them. You know, like it was, that was the first time really understanding the way that music kind of travels to spaces that we can't. And then I would say my next time where it really hit me was being on the Boy Meets World Tour in Germany. I think it was Germany. And knowing that English wasn't the first language of most people, but they were screaming every word to songs. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, cause that's like a, that's like a, another language you've crossed into just based on how they feel about your music, you know? That's insane. Right. That is insane. Like, I can only imagine the feeling of hearing 20,000, 30,000 people just singing word for word the song that you made. Like, you know, like that's crazy. For sure. And especially with the song like Hotline Bling, like, I made that when I lived in my parents' basement. <laughs> wow. That was humble beginnings or whatever that means, you know, like 
at those times, not like I'm saying, like not even sure that this was the type of career that was going to pay the bills. And to then be in these arenas and places all around the world and have people literally screaming those lyrics back at you, knowing <laughs> a year ago you were in your parents' basement, like just trying to put some beats together, hoping something would connect. And then it, it does in like, the biggest way. Do you still get goosebumps like every time it happens? Does it still feel like the first time when you first heard them screaming your songs? Or are you used to it at this point? It's not every time because I'm a very nonchalant person. So part of me also tries to like ignore the magnitude of things. Like I try not to like fall for my own hype, like, yo, I did this or, you know, like pay attention to it too much. But every now and then I do kind of step back and realize, like, for instance, the first time I heard Hold On, We're Going Home, I was standing at the bus stop and somebody drove by and stopped in front of me and they were playing that record. You know, I'm like, I, I didn't even have a car at the time. Wow. You know? So those things do kind of hit me from time to time but because i am like i'm saying i'm so uh like passive about my own success or even like celebrating myself a lot of times i try to not ignore but kind of like not pay too much attention just because i don't ever want to feel i guess maybe like too caught up in the stuff I'm, I've done. Like I still want to be whoever I was before I had those records. You know, like I don't want those records in any way to define like my view of myself or even the way other people view me. Like I'd still like people to have the same respect or lack of respect. Like if you didn't respect me before, don't respect me now. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't want anything to be different based on being like the guy who has hit records. So that's why it's always been a little bit awkward for me to even acknowledge some of my successes. And I, I, I think I do have to work on it because I do realize there's moments where I should celebrate like some of these wins. These are things that people will go their whole life and never do. And I've done some of them like six, seven times. Yeah. Those are, those are definitely special moments. I'm just so afraid of being that person that is caught up in the, the moments for those moments, as opposed to just like maintaining, you know, the essence of whoever I was before big records, before success, before being division, whatever that means, you know? Yeah, definitely. 100%. Well, I mean, we know about everything you've done with Drake, and everybody knows that. But you've also worked with a wider array of artists, like you know, Future and Travis, and even icons like Mariah Carey. How do you decide who you want to give a beat to, or what beat should go to who when you're prepping everything? Um, in the world of producers, I I probably am like one of the slowest as far as my output, like I really don't make that much compared to what some of these other guys do. Like I, like some of my friends bang up nine, 10 beats a day. I wish I could do that. So, so that is problem number one I have. And I think problem number two is I hate sending my music out. Like I, I actually hesitate a lot. Like I don't, I don't know something about that process. I'm not the best at just like sharing everything so a lot of times i would say unless i make something and i i really feel like it belongs with a certain person a lot of times my management will be the ones to kind of start the converse conversation like hey mariah carey wants to get in with you or travis is looking for stuff do you have anything but it's not like i'm necessarily making a bunch of folders and sending out to everybody like i know most producers are i'm getting better at it now because i am trying to be more proactive 
for whatever that means, just because I'll say that and then still just like not send stuff to people. <laughs> so <laughs> it's um, the work in progress. Um, I will say I'm super, super fortunate to have some of the records I do have because those act like my business card or my calling card. So I've been put in great situations based on other people hearing these songs and be like, I need that guy. Where if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't be in a lot of rooms just because I'm not like the most outspoken person, you know? And I feel like in some ways, the way the industry is now, like the people who are good at self-promotion do get a lot more opportunities that I can probably open up for myself. Just because I'm not like, I'm not the most loud person when it comes to what I do or who I'd want to work with. So there's a lot of times I'll even see on social media the way other producers are able to kind of sell themselves and then have people reach out based on that. And honestly, I'm like, yo, kudos to you. I, I wish I could be that person. You know, I wish I could kind of open myself up for more collaboration in that way. I'm just like, it's it's honestly hard for me to even post stuff I've done. I'm, I'm getting a little bit better and I'm trying to be more aware of the eyes that I do have on me and, and how social media is such a tool. But it's funny you ask that question because I'm not necessarily the best when it comes to reaching out to artists or setting up those situations just because that's just like so far from my personality. Definitely. Do you have anybody in mind that you have not worked with that you definitely want to work with before, you know, everything is all said and done? I'd love to work with uh, 21 Savage, Young Thug, Solange, Jay. You know, I'm saying <laughs> yeah. like that because I'm also like, I don't know if Jay's putting out anything anytime soon, but right. I think that's just like a dream of mine. And then. I think I'd, I'd really like to do some stuff that's not even in an urban space, just some things you wouldn't expect. Definitely. Another question. Other than OVO production team, like, you know, OVO, Noel, 40, who are your favorite, you know, producers in the game? Favorite producers, uh, Metro. Metro Boomin, that's my guy. He's always up there. Who else right now? Um, it's crazy. Literally, everybody that comes to mind is like on my team, so I'm trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind that. That's why I make sure, you know, listen to my friends. Uh, my guy Cardo's been killing it. Um, who else? Wow, I, I guess all of my favorites really are my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I mean, you guys, the type of music that you guys make is hard to not enjoy. <laughs> what is coming out of your collection? London. Say, I'll say London. Yeah, um, yeah I, I guess. I guess those are the main people that come to mind. Uh, DJ Dahi for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is not a bad stable of guys you've named already, like Metro, Cardo, London. Yeah, DJ. Metro, Cardo, Dahi, um, Ludwig. I've, yeah. Well, I've worked with him. Um, yeah, like. Even in my answer, like I'm friends with all the guys I named. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm still cheating. I don't know. Still, you for sure. And like you, you just spoke on how you you struggle with putting. I don't want to say pumping, like patting yourself on the back or chest pounding, but like making it know what you've done. Do you? Are you somebody who's 
just takes pride, like you said, somebody hears a song that you made and they ask for you, not knowing that it was you who made it. Do you take pride in just letting the work speak for itself and whatever the universe, the energy that's out there, it comes back to you? Is that the type of person that you see yourself as? Definitely. I think that's also why I've struggled with the idea of using a producer tag because some people are like, I guess they always encourage me, you should just put a tag on your records because you have some of the biggest records. If you did that, that would be all the self-promotion. But yeah. the other side of me just feels like, just let the music be the music. Like Quincy didn't say Quincy at the beginning of Michael records. That's a fact. Right. You just had to go and find out like, yo, that that's all Quincy Jones. And that in itself was like an accomplishment for Quincy Jones when you realize he did that. And then he also was Frank Sinatra's band director for years. Like those are the things that I think the guys like us gravitate towards because we love music so much. So we are the type that are going to go and do our research and do the Googles and be like, oh, yo, this guy did this song and he did this record and he wrote on that song. Like I, I like that as well. And I also wish I could be, you know, like, Metro, Murder, some of those guys were their tag kind of speaks volumes for them too. And that's like, I don't know. A different version of me would 100% put on a tag and probably make myself way more money because that is <laughs> more business. You know, it's just like, it's that, I, I guess that is like the artist in me being indecisive about what I want more, the name or, you know, just the humble accreditation or like, I don't know. It, like that's the weird part of how I, I guess, view my artistry. Like maybe sometimes I am too concerned with that stuff and I should just slap a tag or like promote myself more so that I don't have to work as hard behind the scenes. But then when I do see somebody's face, when they pull up their favorite song and then they hit me and they're like, yo, I didn't know you did that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I can't even imagine a tag on like some of the records that you've made. Like I'm trying to envision a tag on, like I said, the line <laughs> or too deep or something like that. I just couldn't even imagine a producer. Well, it can even be really creative. Like Pharrell does the four beats for. The four yeah, that's true. Right. I know that is. That's a Pharrell record, but I don't know. I I also feel a little bit weird trying to own that space of whatever it is for the artists. You know, like just let it be the artist moment, and then when it's your time for people to know, like you're the guy that did that, then it'll it'll happen. Or if you do it enough, people around you will start talking and say, you're the guy that did it. So you don't really have to say that much. It's a fact. That is. And so one more question. I have one more question for you, and then I'll let Drew have whatever you might have. When it comes to your career and everything you've done at this point, of course, it's probably hard to differentiate or pick what a favorite record is or anything like that. But do you have any record that you just, when you made it and once you heard the final version of it, it was all completed, like that you just still hold close to you that hits you a little bit differently than anything else you've made? I'll say too much. Too much? Too much off of nothing was the same. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think, well, for one, because like I said, I always wanted to be a rap producer and I wanted to be the Kanye West, Just Blaze, that type of producer. So that, when I say that, if you go back and listen to that, you go, oh yeah, 100%, I get that. And yeah. two, I think that record put Drake in a space, like Drake is already a pretty vulnerable artist. So for that record to bring him to an even more vulnerable place, I feel like that record spoke to him also the way it speaks to like a lot of people when they heard that record but still to this day that's that i think that is the one record that people are just like blown away like yo you did that too you know like <laughs> one thing to do the hits but to be able to do 
like the complete opposite of like, yo, that's my favorite cut off the album. I yeah. think that, like, that record speaks the most for me. Yeah, too much is, that's definitely the like most vulnerable record on Nothing Was The Same, I would say, out of every record on there. And that's my favorite Drake album, Nothing Was The Same. I think that's his, his best album. And so Too Much right. is definitely you know, tracks on there, so for sure. We all good? Well, Are you doing? We gotta get. We gotta get. We got one more. I know you can't. Speak, you can't speak anything like too crazy on it. Right? CLB is coming top of the year, of course, allegedly, supposedly. Like, do you have anything up your sleeve on that album, or do we just have to wait and see about what, what comes to what comes from? It? Well, I will just say that there are always Drake nineteen eighty five records that the public hasn't heard. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we appreciate you taking the time out to to sit down and talk with us, man. It means the world to us for sure. Uh, more continued success in the future for you in the years to come. Everything that you're doing. Make sure you follow us at Play for Keeps Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And until next time, we're out. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Appreciate you.